Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Chuck Gadridis. Chuck is best known for his one-of-a-kind folding and automatic knives. Because each and every Gadridis knife is unique, sometimes to the point of bizarre, he and his work are a bit of a mystery to me. He expresses himself not only in unusual and useful cutlery designs, but in exotic, natural, and man-made materials. You never know what you'll see on his Instagram feed, but you know it's going to be cool, and I'm excited to find out more about uh, Chuck Gadridis and Gadridis and his knives. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you know each time we upload a video here on YouTube. And of course, if you know knife junkies, please share this video and uh, help spread the word far and wide. And uh, if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by going to Patreon. The quickest way to get there is by going to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Hey, Chuck, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, um, yeah, like I said, I've been following you for a while on Instagram and some, you know, I'm I'm sort of Chuck Gadritis adjacent. Some of the people I know have had your, your knives and... Um, they're very interesting, very unique, and we're going to talk all about them. But uh, I was on Arizona Custom Knives kind of doing a little bit of research on you, and I saw a little write-up, your your bio. And uh, you said that you've been a knife guy since you were six? Uh, I got my first pocket knife when I was five from my grandfather. And, I mean, I'm 45 now, so times were definitely different then. Knives were more acceptable. And I used to fish and whittle and, you know, go play in the woods. My grandfather would make me bows and arrows and slingshots, most of which got confiscated by my mother. Um, but, you know, it was a tool and it was useful and it's something I've carried pretty much every day. You know, it's one of those things that I'd rather have it and not need it. So I always have a knife on me. Well, um, you know, there are a lot of things we carry with us that are uh, useful and you know we keep them on us because we use them but there's uh, something special about knives what was it what what do you think is so special and um compelling about knives uh you know i, I noticed you didn't go into making pencils or um you know <laughs> clothing or or all the other things that we use on a regular basis what was it about knives that it was just a useful tool that say if when i was fishing if I needed to cut the line and retie a new hook on or a new lure on. I didn't have to ask somebody. I could basically just do it myself. So you and I are kind of a similar age. I, I got about five years on you or so. And I, I often uh, remember the entertainment from back then when we were youngsters. And uh, um, there was a lot of, there were a lot of knives in it. Land of the Lost, you know, the father always had a, a belt knife on him. Um, you know, the, the various shows that were on TV back in the 70s and 80s, um, there were lots of knives. Um, to me, that was a, sort of a, a sign of manliness or, or self-reliance, I guess I should say. There, there's one particular movie that really stands out to me to this day is The Black Stallion. And there's a scene in the movie where the dad is, is playing poker and he wins a pocket knife in the pot and he goes back to his ship's quarters and he's going through all the trinkets and stuff that he's won. And he gives his son the pocket knife and this little like bronze horse. And at a little further in the movie, the ship goes down and the kid uses the knife to cut the black stallion free whose reins are tangled up in the ship. Mm -hmm. And he actually grabs onto the horse and it swims to shore and saves him. So in essence, it's that pocket knife that saves him. Exactly. 
You yeah. know, the, the Black Stallion, I remember like kind of purposefully not watching it because my sister watched it. And I remember thinking, well, that, then, then that must be like a girl's movie. So so now I got to go back and check that out. I was recently talking uh, on the show about uh, the movie The Edge. And there's a similar thing. There's a helicopter crash. And uh, the main character is given a, a pocket knife in the first scene. And he uses it to save the pilot or save a friend of his, uh, you know, from an under from underwater doom. So, mm -hmm. so, but useful tool. Yes, definitely useful tool. And it also, um, you know, is a symbol of self-reliance and such. But when I look at your knives now and the stuff you do now, it's taken on a whole, you know, several levels beyond useful tool. Of course, what you're making are useful tools, but there's an artistry to them. What, Tell, tell me about where your head is right now with knives and what your what your philosophy is in your work. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of all over the place. I build all different kinds of mechanisms, all different kinds of knives. I concentrate mostly on folding knives just because I find that they're more challenging than a fixed blade. Um, you know, adding moving parts and having tighter tolerances is what really attracts me to building the knives that I'm building these days. Uh, the other thing is that the autos that I've been concentrating on building for the last year, there aren't many guys doing it anymore. So it's kind of a lost art. So that encourages me to keep going and try to keep the theme of building automatic knives alive. Do you mean in terms of, uh, custom knife makers or uh, and when I say custom, I mean loosely like people who are making handmade knives in their, in their own shop. Uh, are you saying that that's um, that for automatic knives, that's not such a thing. I, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, it kind of seems that way. Back in the late nineties, early two thousands, there was a big boom in automatic knives and there were a lot of guys making them. And a lot of the guys now that, that were making them have either passed away or retired. And so there's probably less than, I've tried to count, 15 or 20 custom knife makers who make custom automatic knives. So who were, who were some of the people that you are influenced by in your pursuit of making the, these awesome automatics? So when, in 1997, I, well, I graduated from high school in 1994. I went to Mass Maritime Academy for two years and I decided that that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. So I transferred to the University of Rhode Island and there's a cutlery store that was in Charlestown named Cove Cutlery. And I got a job there on the weekends, you know, selling knives, cleaning the knives, and a lot of them were customs. And there were these custom knife makers from Rhode Island, um, Ralph Silvidio, Jason Williams and Bill McHenry that would come into the shop occasionally. Mm -hmm. And these guys were some of the forefathers of the custom automatic knife, especially Bill McHenry. Yeah. He's basically one of the, the grandfather of the custom automatic knife and the New England style of custom knives, which is Damascus blade, Damascus bolster, natural handle material, and then file work or other kinds of embellishment. And it all started in New England, especially in Rhode Island. I've never heard that New England style of automatic knife. Is that like, um, and you said, so that's a Damascus bolster, Damascus blade, natural handle. Um, yeah, pearl, mammoth ivory, and embellished file work, carving. Um, and it started in Rhode Island. And so basically anybody else who does it, it kind of moved across the country from Rhode Island, you know, and influenced anyone else who is making that style of folder these days. What do you what do you think um, uh, uh, inspired that combination of materials? I think at the time, not a lot of people were doing it. It was also very difficult to get mammoth ivory. You know, it's kind of unheard of or titanium. Like you need to know someone who worked at an aerospace um, mm. company like Boeing to be able to get titanium back then. I mean, today you can just go online and order it, have it shipped to your house, but you know you couldn't get those materials back then. And I think it just, it was better than just using wood, which is what a lot of makers were using back then. 
Yeah, I thought of uh, whaling for some reason. You, when you described the New England style of um, of knife making or of automatic knives, somehow it reminded me of of whaling and that sort of New England coastal kind of thing. Yeah, I can see that. You know, early whalers used to do scrimshaw and whale's teeth. Right, I'm sure right. they turned them into handles for knives and things like that. You yeah. know, it was byproduct of the whale. That's what I'm thinking of. Scrimshaw, right, right, with okay. the carving and the and the illustrations in the handle. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bill McHenry would just walk in. He's the guy who um, he he put uh, he did a lot for Benchmade. I mean, it, didn't he? Uh, like he he was the co-inventor of the Axis Lock. Okay. Him and his his uh, stepson Jason Williams, and he also designed the Infidel, which is the Benchmade out the front. Okay. And the bench might and a few others, but you know, I never visited other knife maker shops, but they would look at some of the stuff I was doing and give me more of a critique than anything and say, Oh, well, try doing this or try doing that. Or, you know, when I'm doing file work, instead of doing two cuts, do three cuts, you know, add just another dimension to the knife itself. So when you talk about file work, what are you talking about? So, I file work the backspacer of the knife. So instead of having a partial spacer, it runs the entire length of the handle, which gives me a blank canvas to carve on essentially. And I use four main types of files. I use a, a round file, a triangular file, and a half round, and sometimes a square. And that's it, and everything that I do I do with those types of files. So like I have this knife here. You know, we yeah. see that the backspacer and the liners are file work. And it's titanium liners that have been anodized. It's... And then when I open the knife, oh, I, I file work the liners on the inside as well. The inside of the spacer. Like the whole thing gets embellished. So how did you learn the um, the mechanics of, so you're working at Cove Cutlery, you have a few legends walking in uh, somewhat regularly. You get the chance to show them your work and get critiqued by them. Is this how you learned some of the finer points of the craft? Like, and, and, <laughs> and automatics, like how did you learn how to do that? I, I wish it was that easy, but basically it was all trial and error. Like, you know, I didn't have a milling machine. I had a drill press. I would take a bolster and drill a hole at each end and then sit there and, and hand file the slot mm. for a, a latch release. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, you you get the latch fit into the handle, which is the release. And then you fit the blade to the latch. But sometimes if you cut the hole in the blade too large, then when you close the knife, the tip of the blade sticks out. So now you have to make a new blade to fit the latch mm. or a new latch to fit the blade and all of this back and forth, you know, opening a can of worms, fixing one thing, fixing another. And so it was all trial and error. So do you feel at this stage in your career, you have some of that stuff dialed in or is each new knife, I mean, like I like I mentioned before, your knives are all unique. Each one is different from from the next, uh, as as far as I know. Um, do you have to reinvent the wheel each time because you're making these different designs? Not necessarily, no. Uh, you know, the basics are still the same, but sometimes screw placement is key. So if you don't want your bolsters to have a lot of screws showing, and so you have to figure out where to put the screws. Um, to hide them so it's a cleaner look. So it's basically the basic principle is still the same. Mm -hmm. It's just laying everything out how where you want it. And a lot of it's proportionate based on the size of the knife. So I want to, excuse me, I want to talk about your process. But first, let's, uh, for those who are watching, and I'll try and describe these, but for those who are just listening, but Hold up, um, for instance, hold up that uh, that eagle knife that you just finished. And if you would, hold it prominently up so we can see this thing. Look at that. So tell me about, tell us about this knife here. 
So I do all my design on paper. And when I drew it out, you know, with this kind of integral guard in the handle, it looked like a bird. Like it, it just lended itself to that design. So initially, you know, I cut out the liners, I cut out all the parts and I have the bolsters attached. And then I, I basically took a Sharpie and just drew on the design, what I wanted it to look like. And I had studied some pictures. Another big influence in my knife making was a maker named Steven Oslewski from Rhode Island. And he did a lot of figural style knives. And that's what I call this. It's a figural knife. Uh, he did birds. He did a scorpion. He did an elephant. So I studied a lot of his pictures that I found online to kind of get an idea of how I wanted it to look. And the hard part is knowing what to leave and what to remove. And then trying to make both sides match exactly. So it's sculpture. You're, you're, you're reducing the material. Carve, what do you do? Carve it with how do you yeah, uh, carbide burrs in basically like dental burrs and you know okay. different size uh, carbide burrs to remove the material and rough it out. And the hard part is the finish work of removing all of those scratches oh. that you've put in using these carbide tools. So a lot of little hand stones, you know, sandpaper wrapped around a popsicle stick that's been sharpened. Oh. All kinds of things. Just to get in the nooks and crannies. So I, I, I went to art school. I did plenty of soap soapstone sculpture, you know, with chisels. And mm -hmm. that's that's easy enough. You know, that stone is kind of not made for that, but chosen for that purpose. Sure. You know, you you carve away and ev everything that's not uh, David or, or whatever you're sculpting. <laughs> uh, but in your case, you're dealing with super um, durable, hard metals like titanium or... Or, or or steel or what have you, mm -hmm. and you forget that you can't just yeah you, you can't just carve in using a using a uh, an electric tool, and then just have it be what you you need to work that thing and polish that thing uh, until it's at hold that back up if you will uh, until it's a, a a legitimate sculpture. I mean you're you're reducing that material into its final sculpted form. And the eye there is the pivot, huh? Correct. Yes, the pivot screw that I heat colored. And then I also masked off the beak when I acid etched it for for contrast. So that's polished. And the rest of it's uh, just random pattern Damascus. Okay. And so what's the material, the inlay material on the handle? Uh, this is fossil mammoth ivory. Wow. All right. Uh, and then you can see that the back bolster is like the tail feathers of this bird. Now, uh, and that's all Damas Damascus steel too. Yes, please open it. Yep. <laughs> I saw you going for it. <laughs> oh my goodness. So um, now the blade is out and it is an upward swept Persian style blade with a nice long swedge in Damascus steel and it looks like a hollow grind. Um, yep. So, so the, the Damascus on this blade is uh, Jerry Rados Turkish twist Damascus. So it's made out of five individual bars of twist Damascus that are forge welded together. And then I forged it to shape from a square bar. So that way the pattern in the blade follows the profile all the way up to the point. Otherwise, so you, there's all these little stars along the blade. And if you didn't forge it to shape, they would just drop off the edge as you got closer to the point. But since it's forged to shape, they all follow the same flow and shape of the knife. Because you took the steel, I, I'm just gonna try and verbalize this, because you took the steel and you bent it through the forging process. Correct. So, so that pattern um, maintains its integrity, it just curves. As Correct. opposed to if you just had cut that out of a square or a rectangular bar piece of bar stock, you would have uh, the 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 uh, pattern would kind of just trail off the knife. Exactly. Yes. So how how so, long is that blade? Uh, four and three quarters inches. <laughs> yes. So oh my gosh, this thing is uh, okay. So this is kind of an art knife. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
because okay the the reason i say kind of an art knife it's very obviously an art knife but in 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 watching um the progress you put a lot of progress uh shots up on instagram and in looking at the progress i'm seeing I'm seeing the pro uh, a, a lot of the process I see other knife makers going through, and I'm and I'm also aware of the fact that you're making a very useful, um, you know, it's a utilitarian product. It's a tool, and um, I kind of until you see the last finishing moment, it 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 has that. Except, I mean, you look at that Marlin. That's that's obviously <laughs> that's obviously some piece of artwork going on, um, but. I guess I'm putting it together right now because you you do a lot of other things like swing guard stiletto style knives and um, like that one in the middle right now with the with the double double hollow grind, you know, a lot of these kind of seem uh, like knives I could see having and using, um, and then until they're finished and and they're like things I would put in a case. <laughs> Pretty much, uh, I mean. There are so many people right now building knives that I feel are similar, you know, frame lock flippers or frame locks that are, you know, titanium slabs, stainless blade, you know? So I feel that at this point in my career, I've been doing this long enough. I need to really step outside and do something that's going to may offset me from everybody else. Yeah. Hey, Jim, can you, can you stop it right there? So we can, and, and just go back a little bit. Um, I just mentioned a swing guard uh, stiletto uh, style um, automatic there. What what are the challenges of making a knife like that? It looks relatively simple, but it doesn't, I can't imagine it is in the build. Um, so first off, it's an automatic. So you have springs and moving parts. Then you also add the swing guards, which have to be tight in the closed position and in the open position. And the spring has to be strong enough to be able to flip the blade out and the swing guards themselves. And each of the swing guards are screwed into the blade, so they work independently of each other. So the, those also have to work together as the blade swings out. So it's a challenging thing. It's a, it, it's something that we've seen. We've seen swing guard and, and I, I don't know, I'm sure most of us have handled the cheap, uh, the cheap tourist pieces with the swing guards. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not that. <laughs> no, far from it. You know, multi-bar Damascus blade, mother of pearl scales. There's mother of pearl inlays on the back spacer. So, yeah. Well, not, not only that, but that engineering, like the way you're describing the considerations that go into making that swing guard. Because to me, that's the star of the show. Uh, it, it is that swing guard and, and it has to be perfect on in both the opened and closed positions. And that takes a lot of engineering. It does. And it's a lot of fitting because you'll get it tight in the open position, but it'll be loose in the closed position. Mm. So then you have to start over and make another set of guards and take a little bit of material off the top of the knife. So that way they're tight in both positions. It's a lot of fitting back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So what's your process? So what's your, uh, I know for each knife it must be different, but there's gotta be some sort of overarching process uh, how you make a knife. Um, take us soup to nuts through the making of a knife. I mean, basically I, I draw everything out on paper. So I have a working template that I can transfer to steel. So that way, if it works on paper or work in steel, I make sure I have room for all the screws, for the spring, for all the mechanics that are going to be involved in the knife. Then I go ahead and trace those patterns into steel and titanium for the liners. I bandsaw everything. I profile everything. And then I spend a lot of time picking out blade material, bolster material, because I don't want the whole knife to be too busy. I want one part of the knife to be the focal point. And usually it's either the blade or the handle because otherwise it's just overwhelming. It's too busy and you don't know which part of it to look at. Yeah. So like with the swing guard, it's got a multi-bar mosaic Damascus blade, but it's only got you know stainless bolsters and pearl scales. So this way the blade is the real focal point of the knife. 
So you you choose. Uh, I call it Mr. Furley issues. Um, remember Mr. Furley from Three's Company? He always sure. had a leisure suit and all these different patterns. And when I see that on a knife, I can appreciate each uh, each part. But sometimes it's just too much, too many patterns next to exactly what you're saying. I, I agree. And then if you throw colored materials in, like Damascus. Then you have a Damascus blade and Damascus bolsters and mammoth ivory scales, and you have different colors and patterns, and it looks like a clown threw up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. That's another good one. Uh, so, so you you kind of figure out what what the look is going to be. You work it well. You work it out on paper mechanically, and you know at, at a certain point that that's going to translate into the what the end product. Yes. Uh, end materials will be you kind of choose the materials aesthetically so that they don't clash and get too busy uh, then then how does the actual building of the knife progress um, once everything's profiled you know then I start drilling holes I drill holes for where the backspace is going to go I lay out all the holes for the scales the bolsters um, and then I so I use double-sided tape to stick the liners together so when I drill holes everything lines up perfectly. Mm. And once all the holes are drilled, I pull the scales apart. Uh, I have the backspacer cut out and I transfer the holes to the backspacer. And then I can start tapping holes on one side and screw everything together. And then I have the two liners and the backspacer and usually the blade put together. And essentially then I can lay out where the blade grind is going to go. And then you know, I rough cut bolsters and attach bolsters, attach scales, profile everything, and then start, you know, hand shaping everything for a radius on the bolsters and scales. And then I hand sand everything mm. to four or 600 grit. And then I, the last thing I do, you know, after I heat treat and grind the blade, um, all the file work and embellishment gets done at the end because otherwise you're going to end up grinding it all off. Oh. So is this like how how long for instance uh let's let's think about the um uh the eagle knife you just showed the bird knife you just showed how long does something like that take how long did that one take for instance uh something like that usually takes me about a week wow. uh, I don't know how many hours but you know you got to get to a certain point where the knife is built then you can start carving the eagle head in and you know cleaning all that up and then clean carving in the feathers on the rear bolster. And, you know, by then the knife was operating. I mean, I didn't have to carve any of that stuff in. I could have just left it plain, but it, you know, brought it up another level by doing that. It was calling out to you. you sometimes you hear uh, authors talking about how um, the book starts to write itself or the characters start to dictate what they're going to do once you start writing. It's kind of what this sounds like to me. You know, you you mapped out a shape, and you're like, "This looks like a bird," and then and then you end up with this masterpiece. At, at first, I wasn't going to do it, and then I said, "You know what? What do I have to lose?" You know, it's either the hard part is putting subpar carving on a really great knife, mm -hmm. and that might bring the the quality of the knife down visually just because it doesn't look great. So. You know, if it didn't turn out great, I had more Damascus. I could always just swapped out the bolsters and put new ones on and left the knife plain Jane. But I'm happy that I, I took the the plunge and, and tried to do it. You know? yeah, and essentially, it, that's my first real figural knife. It doesn't seem like you do much plain Jane. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, uh, I, you also have a... Um, a marlin knife which i want to talk about in just a second but uh so i, I just want to ask you one thing about your process you mentioned that you 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 tap and you screw it together do you um encourage the disassembly of your knives like um or you know when you said screw i was like oh it sounds like you can take it apart is that is that something you know a lot of knife guys like to fidget and take their knives yeah. apart and stuff I would rather people not, especially the autos, because there's a lot of parts that you can't see and a lot of fine tuning goes into it. And I also build them that I know how they go together, 
but other people, you know, if you don't take screws out and put that screw right back in the same exact hole that it came out of, the knife's not going to go back together the way that it, you think it will. So if you mix them up or drop them and you have not, screws of different lengths, hmm. the knife's not going to go back together the same way. Right. And it's not like you get you get used to taking production knives apart. There are certain things you learn to expect, you know, sure. so you, you take enough spider codes and bench maids and hinderers apart. You kind of know what what you're getting into. But when each piece is a unique thing, um, well, when you're building it, it's asking for different builds. It's asking for different uh, screws and placements and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's it's not going to be intuitive unless you're you. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, a lot of hidden screws. So you have to know the order to take the knife apart in. You can't just start unscrewing things and expect it to come apart the way you want it to. So figural knives. Uh, this is the first time I've heard this expression. Um, and Tell me about this Marlin knife. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. It's kind of the latest thing I've seen in your, <laughs> in your feed. So about 20 years ago, the early 2000s, I did one. And it had a Damascus blade and a Damascus tail and mother of pearl scales. And it's basically the same pattern. And I had the idea to do a knife that was a Marlin. And when it was open, it's a swordfish. <laughs> And, you know, the first one, I made a picture frame that had a couple of brass pins in it that you can mount the fish in. And I had tied a hand, a hand tied a fishing fly and mounted that in the frame. Wow. So it looked like it was a mounted fish. And so this year is the 40th anniversary of Blade Show. So I decided to revisit this knife design. So I found the pattern going through a box of stuff and said, all right, how can I make this better? How can I improve on this? So this one has got its Damascus bolsters, front and rear. It's got a Damascus adipose fin. The back spacer is Damascus, and it's raised to look more like the fin on a marlin or a swordfish. And the fin that's right here in the bolster is actually the blade release to turn it into the swordfish. But on this one, I also added the same 3D carved fin on the opposite side. And this has got blue mammoth ivory. Oh, God. That's got this natural crackle in it. So hold, hold that hold that closer to the camera. And if you're just listening, uh, this is a knife that in the closed position, it's a it's a switchblade. It's an automatic knife in the closed position. It looks like a little sculpture of a swordfish or marlin, uh, and and it, the body is this incredible blue mammoth ivory, and uh, the tail is the bolster and the head is the front bolster. So it looks like the the blade. Um, wait, can you open that? Actually, it looks like the blade sort of. Uh, <laughs> That is ridiculous. That is so cool. I've never seen anything like that. So the blade is a uh, Mike Norris stainless Damascus, uh, single edge, but it's double ground. But yeah, it looks like a, a swordfish when it's open. You know, and the, the the first one it didn't have the the carving on all the fins. You know, it it didn't have as much detail as that this one does. It was more like the profile of the shape of a swordfish without the embellishment on the surface. Correct, yeah. So this one's a, a lot more involved. So who's buying these? Do you have collectors? Do you have like a, a group of people who are, who are um, suckers for your work? <laughs> um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, over the you know over the course of the last year, even though we've been in a pandemic, that I've been building and selling knives, and more and more collectors have caught on to the fact that I'm building automatics, and those are the guys buying them. There's even I have one collector who's a a, a couple who are tattoo artists mm. who weren't used to be into knives and then they kind of get out of it for a while and now they've gotten back into it and they're collecting stuff that they used to collect which were 
automatics from guys like Bill McHenry. So they're looking for similar style knives like that now. These, uh, your knives, um, so I, I have a, a lot of knives and none of them kind of approach what you're doing. And I keep them locked up and squirreled away because I don't want, you know, <laughs> I don't want anyone to take them. But yours, I like they almost belong in a frame except for the fact that they're also usable tools. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're guys who collect watches, guys who collect art, who the art just sits on your wall. At least the knife is a useful tool. You can open an envelope with it. Like this Marlin knife would make a great letter opener on your desk for an executive or somebody who's a big game fisherman who would appreciate that. Um, you know, you sit there and open mail with it. Yeah, yeah. You, it also seems like... Uh... Like with the bird knife, I mean, you know, you could really just use that for anything if you, if you wanted to. Of course, you wouldn't want to. You would, you would want to to keep that thing pristine. But it, but you know, when you say letter opener, I say yes, you could use that as a letter opener. But obviously, um, it's a a lot more stout than just a letter opener. Oh, absolutely! It's, it's your Sunday going to church knife. So that way, if you have it, just in case you need it. Right, right, and it's an artful conversation starter and and conversation piece. So it it seems like with these, with the uniqueness of the uh, one of a kind knife um, approach, you have to be flexible and innovative to make these things work. Absolutely, yeah. Each one's you know a little different. Each one's laid out, and you have to find that collector that likes a one-off. You know, you'll have build a cool knife and other people will say, oh, can you build me one? And say, well, you can build you something similar, but it's not gonna be exactly like the one that you saw. So how does it work for you business-wise? Do, do you have books um, that, that you fill and people tell you what they want? Or are you kind of a, 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 a freewheeler and you make work and, and make it available? How does that work I, for you? I, I, pretty much make what I want to make and put up for sale. Um, occasionally I do have, you know, consistent customers who say, Oh, Hey, can you build one of these for me? Or can you build that? Um, and I will take selective orders. If it's something that I think is really cool or really interesting, then I'll be more than happy to build something for someone, but I don't want to build what everybody else is building. I want to yeah. you know, set myself apart. All right. So, okay, we've been focusing a lot uh, on on your art knives. That's just what I'm going to call them loosely, um, mm -hmm. because they are. <laughs> but uh, what what are your more uh, utility driven designs? What what um, what do you have that you build that where the approach is less about the aesthetics and more about the performance? Say more practical. Yes, more practical. Thank you. <laughs> so in two words. <laughs> so about a year about a year and a half ago, I decided to try to build a scale release automatic. I'd never built one before. Um, it's you know, there's no visible button, there's no latch, there's no way to tell if it's an auto or not. And I built one and I said, you know, this is gonna really lend itself to other designs. And I came up with the idea to build one that looks like a Swiss army knife. And I call it the switch army switchblade. And it's, you know, nostalgic. It was one of the first knives that everybody had as a kid, you know, with all the tools and stuff in it. So I built, I built one that, and this is your, your classic red one. And I put a G on it from my last name. And it's got the toothpick and the tweezers that I buy. So it's the aftermarket ones that Victor Knox or Swiss Army make. And this is a scale release Swiss Army knife. You know, stainless blade, titanium liners, cool. titanium spring. And there are guys that I've made these for that carry them every day. So uh, tell us what a scale release is. This is a uh, kind of a, where you move like a bolster release where you slide the slide Correct. the scale. Yes, the whole scale swivels 
in a clockwise position Arch, to the right. So you slide it to the right and the whole scale swivels and that's the release mechanism. So this seems like something that could be um, uh, your accessible knife, the, the knife that, uh, that um, you know, well, you just said you've made them for people and they carry them every day. Yeah, it seems like that kind of a knife. It also seems like the kind of knife that, uh, oh, look at that one. That's gorgeous. That uh, someone like such as yourself who's, who makes art knives, this could be uh, like a crossover um, knife that reaches out to a broader audience. Absolutely. There are guys who collect Swiss Army knives because they make them in all different patterns, all different mm -hmm. color, handle material. And so, yes, this um, is attractive to them. It's also attractive to somebody who wants an automatic but doesn't want something that anyone else knows how to open. Like I can hand these to people and nobody knows how to open it. So it's, it's very covert. Yeah. Um, you could get pulled over and if you got to empty your pockets, it looks like a Swiss Army knife. Yeah. Nobody's going to know the difference. So. Yeah. And he's going to be like, thanks for the knife. Go get yourself one. <laughs> yeah. Man, so do you make these in uh, batches? I, I do. I usually you know, cut out all the parts for about a batch of 12 or so. And then I'll split that in half and do six at a time. And I've been having a lot of fun playing with different handle materials, different finishes, um, you know, anywhere from ironwood to different kinds of micarta, G10, mm -hmm. um, crazy fiber, which is, you know, sort of this twisted micarta that it's an end cut. And so it's got its own unique pattern to it. Uh, but I don't take orders for those, these because the demand is so high that I can sell them all day long. So I usually put them on Instagram, first come, first serve. Or I have a lottery if I have three or four of them. That way everybody gets a chance. Right, right. Watch people claw each other's eyes out to get at them. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, man. I, I Yeah. Now, now you've planted a seed in my mind. Uh, I, I really, I do like the idea of it as well as the, um, as well as the, the, the way it looks. Uh, what else, what else do you have on the table? You said you had a, a couple here. I'd, I'd, I'd love to take a look at a couple of these. So this one is also a Swiss army knife, but this one is a, a magic knife as they it's termed. So this one's got two blades. So one is a bottle opener slash screwdriver mm. slash pry bar tip and it's a liner lock and but when you close it if you depress it it opens the main blade wow that is so cool that's so unique and so that's also a liner lock what is that uh, handle material uh, it's red g10 Red G10, and then you, um, and then you uh, uh, in, um, embed. What's the word? Inlay that G. I, I use a milling machine, and I mill out the G, and then I fill it with um, oil-based paint. Oh. So I can do them in different colors. So I can do the G, you know, to complement the knife. Either do them in white, red, black, blue, um, a variety of colors. So okay, this begs the question. Um, and 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 I think I might know the answer only because I I think I'm tapping into your spirit a little bit as an artist and knife maker. But how do you feel about collaborations? Um, this these knives in particular seem like something that could possibly, you know, with the right combination of uh, entities involved, could be some sort of a custom collaboration kind of thing, production thing. Yeah, I, I th hopefully at Blade Show, I'm going to pursue that a little bit, especially oh. with the, the Magic Knife, because there's a company that makes a bolster release. And if I use the way they – so they build theirs as a lockback, and mm -hmm. this one is built as a liner lock. But if I converted this to a lockback, then it would be easier to build for them, and you could still have it have the other tool – the bottle opener, or you could add a second small pen blade as the release, or there's a variety of other tools that you could add to it. So I'm so, hoping I'm hoping to approach them at Blade Show. 
Oh man, I I think I think that would be so cool. I mean, because in a way, it it might make it more accessible to a like I said to a broader audience, and and maybe bring it more within reach to to budding collectors of your work or or <laughs> aspiring collectors of your work. Sure. Uh, so you you will be at Blade Show this year. What what are you um, bringing? How have you been there before? And like, how do you decide what to take? This will be my twentieth year. <laughs> So, so cool. in 2000 was the first year I went. I graduated from college, and I decided to fly down and check it out and see what it was all about. Mm -hmm. And so I, while I was there, I signed up, and I got a table, and 2001 was my first year, and I've been going ever since. So um, usually I just build what I want to build, and I try to bring, you know, about a dozen knives or so, and usually they're first come, first serve. And put them out on the table, and... Hope that they go home with someone. So, uh, what do you get out of it? Um, what what have, or I should say, what have you gotten out of Blade? How has it helped your career as a knife maker? Um, it's promotion. It's meeting other makers. Mm. It's being able to hand select materials while you're there. You know, that's that's a real key point because it's easy to to buy like ivory and pearl online, but when you get it. It may not fit your application. There might be hairline cracks in it. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a great place to to buy materials. And I guess now I'm considered one of the OGs of Blade Show since I've been going for so long. <laughs> wow, that's cool. So so you're gonna bring this Marlin knife with you, and that's gonna be part of your you you're gonna put that up for sale, or is that gonna be a a a, a sort of a raffle kind of thing, or? It'll be up for sale, but Blade Show also has different categories for awards. They have best of the rest, they have best art knife, best of the show, best folding knife, best tactical. So I'm hoping to enter it into one of those categories and maybe it'll win. Oh man, I, I could see it going into, you know, best automatic. It could be in best uh, art knife. I mean, cause that is, you know, it's totally unique. It's you I, know, I was thinking best of the rest because it kind of doesn't really fit into a knife category. No, what is yeah. the best of the rest? Uh, so if, if it doesn't fit into a particular category, it's best of the uh, other. I got, you. I got you. Other knives. So if you come with like a really awesome tomahawk, you might put it in best of the rest, or correct. Okay, yes. a sword or something like that. Man, so. How do you want to see uh, Gadritis knives grow? How do, how do you how do you go into the future? Are you are you the lone artist toiling away in his studio? Um, <laughs> to me, that's a very romantic notion. Uh, I know a lot of people have uh, um, uh, have have the idea that you're always growing, grow, 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 bigger, 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 um, and that's cool too. I mean, I get that as well. Um, how do you see yourself and how do you see um, your company in, in in another 20 years? Well, stuff I'm trying to do now is working smarter, not harder. <laughs> so working in batches makes that easier. Um, approaching production companies to, you know, maybe produce a design for you is working smarter. Um, I have a collaboration coming out with Boker. That's going to be released uh, later this month, where I designed a folding smatch it. Oh my God! Wait, wait, wait! Is it the folding? Has it come out yet? It has, uh, so Blade HQ approached me two years ago with Blade, and they thought it was a great design, and they approached Boker, and Boker liked it enough that so Blade HQ is going to have a limited run available through them, and there's going to be a standard version, uh, Boker Plus. Um, available through Boker, and it's going to be released from Blade HQ on the twenty first of May. Have they been released in Europe? I think maybe one of my European friends might have one. I, I think they have been, and okay. Boker posted on Instagram and okay. on their website pictures okay. of it. Um, All right, I, so I'm that's coming out. I I actually talked about this on one of my podcasts a, uh, a couple of months back. I, I was like, I heard that they're coming out with a smatch because I think I think I saw an article in Knife News. That's one of my favorite all time knives. I love uh, combat knives. I love historical war knives, um, and the smatch it to me is is just 
if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a it's a big leaf shaped. It's like a 13, 12 inch leaf shaped blade, double edged, that was made for commandos in World War II, I think, or World mm -hmm. War One. And uh, man, you nailed the design in a folding version. It just uh, okay. I didn't. I, I guess I forgot that was yours, or didn't <laughs> know that was yours. Congratulations! That is Thank so you. cool. Uh, not only on, on on a you know a collaboration knife with Boker, who makes some fine knives, but also on on taking that historical design and doing it justice. I appreciate that. Thank you. So do I, and I will be I will be throwing my hat in over at Blade HQ. That's uh, that's really cool to hear. Do you have any other uh, knives with you that uh, that you could show the audience to uh, kind yeah. of whet their appetite? So this is hard to see. This is a, a slip joint that I made, a uh, four and a quarter inch blade. It's got front and rear Mokame bolsters in green mammoth ivory scales. Hmm. And uh, it's kind of a, a Persian. It's called a, wow. a toucan is the model. And it's got a damascus steel blade. And let's see the file work on that. So this has got a uh, oh, rope, rope pattern file work all the way down, and then it's raised. And the lanyard hole here in the butt end of the spring is integral to the spring. So I file worked it all the way down and left it raised, and then I cut a D shape out with a file into the butt end of the spring. And that uh, that mammoth ivory is stunning. And I make all my slip joints with a, a half stop, so it stops halfway, so you can get your fingers out of the way. Yeah, I was gonna say, watching you pull that open, the effort it took, I was like, you better have a half stop in that sucker. <laughs> that is cool. So, uh, so you make autos, you make slip joints, you make uh, well automatics of all these different uh, ilk, slip joints. Uh, any any of those uh, standard titanium frame locks? Not so much anymore. Uh, I make ballet songs. I make multi-blade slip joints. You know, a little bit of everything. Kitchen knives once in a while. I made myself a set of fillet knives this year for the upcoming fishing season. Oh, right on. So do you find, what, which do you like the best? If you could only be allowed to make one style of knife from here on out, what would you end up making? I would have to say it'd have to be art knives, like similar to the Eagle or similar to the Marlin, because it allows me to just express myself creatively and do whatever I want and pick and choose materials and just have it, have it flow. So even if I could make that style of knife for the rest of my life and not even sell them, I would still love and continue to make that style of knife. So in that in that uh, style of knife, you said you draw everything out on paper. Is that, you know, is that only the mechanics of it? Because as you said, the the bird kind of presented itself to you once you drew it. Or are, are you before you do the carving? Are you drawing out what the carving is also? Um, not on the paper template. Okay. And so I draw the blade, then I draw the handle. And then I figure out where the pivot pin is going to be. And I actually have a working template with the, the two pieces of paper. So I have boxes of templates, blades and handles, just boxes of paper templates from over the last 20 years. And once the knife is partially assembled, you know, then I can look at it and say, all right, do I want to carve on this? You know, what does it look like? Whereas with the Marlin, I specifically – went out to build that you know it didn't present itself as i was building through the process right right so the, the bird more presented itself as as i drew it out you know once i drew with a pivot in drew a, you know a line through it it's like okay that kind of looks like a bird's eye this could be an eagle it could be a cockatiel it could be a you know a variety of different kinds of birds so, so with all of these knives um and all these knife styles, uh, art knives is what you choose. What about stuff that you haven't done that you'd really like to try? 
Um, you know, I, I said I build multi-blade slip joints. One that I haven't done yet is a split back whittler, mm -hmm. which is a three blade knife, you know, two small blades for whittling and a main blade. And the main blade rides on this two springs for the two small blades. So you have two springs and three blades and they all have to fit into this one handle and not rub against each other. So that's probably my ultimate goal for a slip joint. Yeah, that's the one that uh, whenever GEC comes out with a split back Whittler, which isn't that often, people, I mean, people are already climbing all over each other to get <laughs> whatever they release. But sure. that one in particular, because the whole spring setup is so unique and it has to be just right to work. Yeah, I've, I've talked to Bill Rupel about it. I talked to Tony Bowes about it oh, at Blade nice. Show a few years ago. And, you know, there's a, a spacer in between the two springs that has to have just the right amount of taper to get it to work right. So one of these days I'll get around to it. Well, uh, I think we're all rooting for you. <laughs> Good luck with that. I'm sure it'll be uh, beautiful. Uh, before we sign off, uh, let me just, I just got to ask you, you have any, any other cool knives in front of you that, that I don't want to miss or I don't want anyone else to miss? I do have this, this other large automatic. Yeah. It's got uh, off-white G10 scales, Damascus bolsters. It's got a Damascus latch, but I put a Damascus inlay mm. in it, and it's a uh, Vegas Forge uh, Typhoon pattern stainless Damascus wow. blade. Man, I'm speechless. That is absolutely gorgeous. So let everyone know what table you're you're going to be at at uh, at Blade Show, and um, also just kind of how they can hope to buy one of your knives. Not <laughs> not just at Blade, but whenever. Like, wh what's the best way to get one of your knives, and also where they can find you at Blade? Um, my table is five E at the Blade Show. It's been the same table I've had for the last. 15 years um you know even though the show, show keeps getting bigger and bigger i'm at the same table um you can either buy one of my knives at the shows or contact me on instagram or facebook send me a message and if it's something i'm interested in building you know we can talk about it talk about materials talk about design or if it's an existing model that i make and we can talk about you know materials and price points and, and go from there you know, usually Instagram or Facebook or even just email is the easiest way to get a hold of me. All right. Well, Chuck, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It was so great to talk to you and so cool to see your knives uh, after kind of stalking you on Instagram. <laughs> um, and I, I will be a Blade Show. This is my first time ever going, and I'm really excited. And uh, I look forward to shaking your hand, sir, and, and, Absolutely. Uh, and holding one of your knives in my hand. Even well, even if just for a brief moment in time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me, Bob. This is a lot of fun. Uh, it's my pleasure, sir. Take care. Thank you. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. I know I'm always going off on what is art and what is design and knives are designed, but I got to say, um, you know, even though these are usable pieces that Chuck Gadritis is making, uh, just his whole approach and the work he's making, I got to say, this is an artist making art, um, very useful art. Uh, anyway, I look forward to uh, meeting him at Blade Show and meeting all of you. Uh, please join us here next Sunday for another interview with another great knife person making the whole knife world that we love so much happen. Um, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I appreciate you. He appreciates you. Have a great week and uh, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.